Hello, this is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. Dot net at that address. And this is Dr. Abraham Weisfeld speaking here. And uh, I could reiterate that I'm a political scientist, uh, completed my PhD thesis at the Université de Québec, Montréal, here in uh, Montréal, Québec. And we're going to continue with the reading of Lars Fischer's uh, study and book published by Yale University Press. No, sorry. This is published by Cambridge University Press, entitled Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State, that is, during the time of the Second International. And we go now to share here. And we've reached, I think it's page 103. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Here we go. The Social Democratic Party Congress of 1903. Oh, the big split between the Jewish Bund and the Communist Party. Okay. This is the creation of the Communist Party and the destruction of the Federation that was the Social Democratic Party of Russia. Hmm? In order to create this Communist Party, there was the destruction of a federated party which included the communists of Iskra and the Jewish Bund together in the same party. But it was a federated party and it worked, but it was destroyed and then eventually created a state that destroyed itself as well. So here we go, 1903, very important. Okay. Imagine the following scenario. Okay. My class is on since I have overdone it, as usual. A fairly well-known backbencher with a sideline in journalism launches a scathing attack on a prominent colleague within his or her own party. Among the backbencher's misgivings is the following. The colleague in question tried to help a former anti-Semite find acceptance and role within the party. In how many ways could we interpret the thrust of this critique? Admittedly, our backbencher might be making such a big deal of this issue because he or she is out to get the prominent colleague in question for other reasons anyway. To be sure, how the party should deal with former anti-Semites may be a question with more general implications. Even so, this much is surely clear. It would make no sense to criticize somebody for supporting a former anti-Semite unless one assumed that this former anti-Semite was not really a former anti-Semite at all, and in fact still subscribed to a prob problematic stance on the Jewish question. <laughs> okay, what's the difference? The actual accusation then is this. Either the prominent colleague in question is profoundly lacking in sensitivity or the still problematic nature of the not-so-former anti-Semites' attitude towards the Jews, or, even worse, the colleague in question, in fact, sympathizes with that attitude, at least in part. Take, then, the following occurrence. Okay. The revisionist Edmund Fischer, 1864-1925, to represented... Zitau in the Reichstag and wrote regularly for the Sozialistische Monatschaft. For a time, he also edited a regional weekly with close ties to the Sassische Arbeiterzeitung called Der Armee Zufel aus der Oberlassitz. The poor devil from the Oberlassitz, the Oberlassitz is the region around Zito. There, in the autumn of 1903, he published a scathing attack on Meiring. Oh, among other things, he criticized Meiring for having supported the attempts of a former anti-Semitic member of the Reichstag called Hans Loos to find a new role within the social democracy. Again, I would contend that there is really only one plausible interpretation for this statement. At best, Meiring's support for Loos demonstrated an unhealthy ambivalence towards Luce's problematic stance regarding the Jews. 
or, even worse, Mehring, in fact, supported Lewis because he himself sympathized with Lewis's anti-Semitism, or at least with certain aspects of it. That footnote seems the only copy of this article that I've been able to trace is among those clippings recalled, 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 uh, collected at the time by Volmar that bear no date. The article ends with a reference to Mehring's related statement in the LDZ of the 24th of October, and hence personally appeared in the edition of Zerhan Melef immediately following the thereafter Fisher the Okay, so it's real. Okay, conversely, had it been beyond doubt that Lewis really was a former anti-Semite, I had his position vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish question been examined and found beyond reproach, then it would have been quite pointless to criticize Mehring for supporting Lewis. If we bring our current sensitivities to Fisher's critique, I find it hard to see how we can interpret it in any other way. Yet, if we examine the background of Fisher's critique in detail, things quickly take a rather surprising turn. The following chapters will examine Fisher's critique and its context from a variety of perspectives and show that what strikes us as the self-evident, indeed only plausible interpretation of this critique is entirely off the mark. Oh. Let us take a closer look then. Fisher's critique was in fact a contribution to a sustained controversy that arose at the Social Democratic Party Congress in Dresden in September 1903. The Congress of Eisenach, 1869, Gotha, 1875, and Erfurt, 1891 apart. The Party Congress in Dresden in 1903 is probably the German Party's best-known Congress prior to World War I. It is so well known because it's a major showdown between revisionists and Marxist traditionalists. <laughs> Wait a second. Huh. This showdown seemed to end with a clear-cut victory over the revisionists. Yet subsequently, this proved a pyrrhic victory, not least because it created a false sense of security among centrists and radicals alike. The Congress was also the scene of another confrontation, though that was even more dramatic any motive than the heated debate on grand strategic issues. This confrontation raged for some two and a half days, 14th, 16th September, that concerned Franz Mehring. The substantive issue at the root of this confrontation was this. Should party journalists contribute to non-party publications, and if so, to what extent and under what conditions? That party journalists should not contribute to anti-socialist publications seemed self-evident. Yet, a second problem lurked here. How did one determine definitively what publications were anti-socialist rather than merely non-socialist? This was a serious enough issue. The party press and many achievements and merits notwithstanding remained persistently underfunded and under-resourced and dogged by mediocrity and narrowness. This was, this was in part the result of material conditions for which there was no quick fix. In part, though, the problem was also aggravated by the reluctance of some of the better educated and more intellectually minded members of the party who had the requisite literary talent to commit themselves fully to the party press. Their often thinly veiled disdain for the mediocrity and narrowness of much of the party press a desire to contribute to periodicals of higher intellectual and literary stature may well have been understandable. Yet it was equally clear that the quality of the party press could hardly be raised without the unreserved commitment of those comrades who instead chose to concentrate their efforts elsewhere. One can well imagine that people like Mehring, who despite their own misgivings and personal reluctance, had dedicated themselves fully to the improvement of the party press and were frustrated and genuinely anguished by this behavior. To them, it was more than obvious where the party's journalists' priorities should lie. That was the substantive core of the dispute. But why did it come to a head in Dresden and blow up in so dramatic a form? Uh huh. Mehring nurtured a long standing and passionate enmity for the prominent publicist Maximilian Hardin 
1861-1927, and he tested his journal, the Zukunft, the future. Zukunft, Zukunft means uh, literally, literally uh, Zukunft, that is which is coming. Yeah, future in English. In the early 1890s, Mehring and Harden had been on friendly terms for a short while. In Mehring's eyes, Harden was by inclination a radical Democrat, and his enthusiasm for Nietzsche merely a youthful aberration. There could be no doubt that Harden was in fact on the verge of, uh, verge of seeing the socialist light, and hence deserved a little tolerance and gentle prodding. Instead, Harden had soon abjured the democratic cause altogether. Far from moving towards socialism, Hardin discovered his heart for Bismarck. He threw his lot in with those who suggested that Germany had gone to seed under Bismarck's successor, Leo von Caprivi, 1831-1899, who had never ceased to enthuse and fantasize about how much better everything could and would have been handled along Bismarckian lines. Even so, Hardin's political orientation was nothing if not highly complex. His Bismarck adulation by no means precluded his remaining a thorn in the side of the establishment. He maintained a fundamental anti-liberalism and anti-capitalism spiced with anti-Jewish and anti-philosemitic rhetoric. His own Jewish extraction notwithstanding. <laughs> no, not another one. In this respect, he was by no means as far removed from the prevalent discourse within socialist democracy as Mehring and others would have us believe. In the Zukunft, Hardin, in any case, published a wide range of authors covering quite an array of political and philosophical positions. This made it extremely difficult to pin the journal's profile down to an unambiguous fashion. Mehring's opponents therefore suggested that one could not simply classify the Zukunft as an anti-socialist publication, and that matters were rather more complicated than Mehring suggested. Okay, break time. Okay. Let's have a pause. Okay, let's resume here. I've had my brownie, and uh, that'll keep me going for a while. Here we go. Share. Show here, and there we go. Okay. <clears throat> to Mehring's mind, Hardin had done more than just not live up to his promise. He had betrayed his true calling by wandering off into the camp of social democracy's opponents. At the same time, Mehring had displayed a serious lack of judgment in his dealings with Hardin, and this was obviously a source of some embarrassment for him. Consequently, the fact that he and Hardin undoubtedly continued to hold more in common than either of them cared to admit must have been a cause of profound unease for Mehring. It is therefore little wonder that he felt such a strong urge to draw a clear line between himself and Hardin, and repeatedly lashed out at Hardin and the Zukunft with a vehemence that could be quite disproportionate. One can well imagine then how outraged Mehring was when, in January of 1903, the young journalist and party member, George Bernhardt, 1875-1944, chose to publish an article on Parti Moral? Oh, yeah, Parti Moral. <laughs> party Morals. Oh. Sounds like an oxymoron. Okay, in Hardin's Zukunft, of all places. It should be added, though, that Mehring by no means stood alone with the anger about Bernhard's peace that he expressed in no uncertain terms in the Naya Zeit. At the Congress in Dresden, it became clear that it had in fact been Kautsky who suggested to Mehring, in the first place, that he should take up the matter and use the opportunity to clarify the party's position on collaboration with the non-socialist press. Kautsky also responded in person to Bernard's subsequent rejoinder. Mehring's critique in the 
Knight's site, in turn led to an official complaint against him by a number of prominent intellectuals and officials on the right wing of the party. Mehring's article, they argue, amounted to an unjustified blanket denunciation of party comrades who collaborated with Hardin and the Zukunft and constituted an attempt to contail their freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Thus, the conflict escalated. The Wachstadt rejected their complaint, and the closer the Congress in Dresden came, the clearer it became that the restrictive position of the Wachstadt on collaboration with the non-socialist press in general, and Zukunft in particular, was backed by the bulk of the party. Many felt that the Wachstadt's response was, if anything, too timid. Consequently, any attempt at the Congress to justify one's collaboration with the Zukunft by presenting it as a journal worthy of the participation of so socialist authors was obviously doomed. At the same time, it also became increasingly clear that the revisionist cause with which the complainants were all closely associated was hardly heading for a field day in Dresden either. Here too, Mehring had to shoulder a fair share of the blame, given that from 1902 to 1907, he stood at the helm of the party's foremost daily, the Leipziger Wolfsteitung, which formed one of the most decisive and most definitely outspoken anti-revisionist strongholds in the party. Against this background, the complainants apparently decided that if they stood no chance against the message, they could at least try to kill the messenger, never mind the merits of the particular case, who, given his checkered past, was marrying to reprimand others for their lack of ideological purity and instances, instances in which they might have strayed from the straight and narrow. The party leadership became aware in the course of the summer that something was brewing. Only days before the Congress, on the 9th of September, Babel wrote to Mehring, I'm assuming that you are also coming to Dresden. I think that is necessary, not least to guarantee instant correction of false accusations, but also to ensure that it does not even appear as though you were ducking the deliberations. Watching a dispute with a revisionist from afar is in any case only half as much fun. Even so, neither Babel and his colleagues nor Mehring himself realized the magnitude of what lay in store. On the afternoon of the first full day of the Congress, 14th of September, 1903, Heinrich Braun, 1854-1927, one of the leading reformist publicists within the party, mounted the most astounding attack on Mehring. No one who knew the full truth about Mehring's checkered past would think of allowing him to pass judgment on the loyalty of others towards the party. Why did Mehring's peers not know the full truth? Because Mehring had misrepresented his past. Quote, you, Mehring, live solely on lies, Brown exclaimed. As an anti-socialist, Mehring had sought to damage the party from the outside. Now he was doing it all the more harm on the inside by sowing discord, both within German social democracy and between the German party and its brother parties abroad. Quote, there is perhaps only one man in Germany who could take pleasure in Mehring's rabble-rousing and party-destroying activities, namely the Prussian police minister, unquote. Brown concluded, quote, Hence I say, as an, en as an enemy, you, directed as Mehring, pose no danger to us, and you would pose no danger to us if you became our enemy again. But we need to protect ourselves against you as a dangerous friend um, who endangers the very core of our party's continued existence. The confrontation escalated even further when Bernhard began to lay into Mary, and it emerged that he was using material from Mehring's earlier private correspondence with Hardin to attack him. This obviously raised the question of how Bernhard had gained access to this material and suggested that the whole assault on Mehring might have been masterminded by Hardin. Babel became increasingly agitated and repeatedly interrupted both Braun and Bernhard. He then defended Mehring at length. He also conceded, though, that Mehring could be exceptionally difficult to get along with, that he had personally found Mehring a psychological enigma. Babel thus coined a phrase of which Mehring was never to hear the last. 
Bering scholars, too, have proved immensely fond of it. Assuming that Hardin had initiated, or at least actively helped prepare, what now looked increasingly like an orchestrated campaign against Mering, Babel launched a massive broadside against Hardin and Zakunft. Not that he did not generally share <clears throat> the notion that the Zakunft was indeed one of the last publications socialist authors should be collaborating with. He had expressly asked Mering prior to the Congress to, to provide him with uh, material on, or rather against, the Zakunft. Clearly then, Babel had intended all along to state the case against collaboration with the Zakunft in no uncertain terms. Now, though, he had had cause to suspect that Hardin stood directly behind this confrontation. His critique of Hardin and Zakunf was presumably even more forceful than it would otherwise have been. We will return to some of his remarks about Hardin later. It transpired soon after the Congress that Hardin's behavior in the run-up to the Congress had perhaps been mischievous, but by no means conspiratorial. Not only had he not masterminded, masterminded the attack on Mehring, when asked to do so, he had, in fact, on one, on at least one occasion, expressly refused to spearhead the assault. Babel thus found himself in the extremely un unenviable position of having to apologize to Hardin. Quote, having now studied pro and contra, Babel explained at a constituency meeting in Berlin on the 6th of October, I have to say, should I be forced to revise anything I said in Dresden, then only what I said against Hardin. He added that the position I am in is far from pleasant. It is infuriating to have to admit that the opponent has behaved more decently than one's own party comrades. Okay. Yes. Page. What page is that now? 108. Ah. Oh. Okay, let's leave it at that. And that's this week's uh, reading of Les Fisher's Socialist, the Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State during the Second International with Social Democrats, Revisionists, and uh, everyone else, Bundes, Communists, the whole bag. Okay. Now, what has inspired in terms of change this week is nothing. The genocide continues in Gaza, and there's a, even a great deal of um, difficulty in arranging for some hours with which to uh, have the World Health Organization enter into Gaza to provide polio shots to vaccinate the children under five against polio so that they won't become paralyzed as one has already succumbed. That's what's happening. Now, in terms of the axis of resistance and Iran's response to the Zionist state's provocation, no news. No news. Now, what could they be waiting for? A moment of faiblesse? A moment of change? Well, it's not going to come unless Iran does it. Okay, speak to you next week. <laughs>